Hello everyone, welcome to another video in a series of videos in which we are talking about different types of complex analyses. Within today's menu, a second part video about survival analysis. Now in this video, we are going to branch out to one particular type of analysis, namely the Cox regression, but more specifically about a Cox regression with a time-dependent covariate. Now, before you watch this, make sure you watch the previous video because you need that information in order to understand what is going on in this particular video. So in the last video, I was talking about a particular assumption that we need to meet when we uh, utilize a Cox regression, which is the proportional hazards assumption. Today, we'll be taking a look at how you can assess that and what you can do if you do not meet this assumption. So let's get right into it. So before we get into the data set that I have open right here, let's take a look at the results of our Kaplan-Meier procedure from last video. So remember in that video, we looked at the survival functions of uh, smokers and non-smokers when it came to uh, dying. And we found the following curves. Now, in this case, I said that we, uh, we uh, met the assumption of proportional hazards. And the way that you can actually check that, there was multiple ways, but the most crude way or the visual way of assessing this is by taking simply taking a look at the curves. And the way to assess that visually is to look at whether the curves are more or less parallel to each other, which means that at each point in time, the hazard of dying in this case is always the same amount of times greater at any given time port for smokers versus non-smokers. And that is important because remember that in Cox regression, we estimated one regression coefficient, which gives us one estimate of the difference in hazard or the hazard ratio between smokers and non-smokers. And the only way that that estimate can be valid is if we indeed fulfill this criteria, this assumption that um, the hazards are indeed constant over time. Now, of course, we're going to take a look at an example where the proportional hazard assumption is not met. And for that, we're going to use a new data set. It is simulated data as well. Uh, the data set reg uh, regards data uh, from uh, a study, a hypothetical study in which a new type of medication uh, was looked at uh, versus a standard medication. And the status of interest, which we have over here, was whether somebody recovered or whether the um, whether the effects that the medication aims to achieve uh, were found and after how many days that happened. So of course we have our status variable. In this case, one is the event that we're interested in, which is recovered. And zero, of course, once again, stands for censored. We have medication, which uh, zero is coded as standard medication and one as the newly developed medication. We have our variable time, obviously, and we also have gender. In this case, codings are not given, but we, won't, we will not be using this variable anyways. And we also have a patient ID uh, unique identifier. Now, the first thing that you will always want to do when you have any type of survival data, make sure to visualize the data. Make sure you use your Kaplan-Meier estimate. So that's what we're going to be doing right now. We'll go to survival, Kaplan-Meier, and of course, we'll insert everything as we've learned it in the previous video, the status variable, define our event, which was one, the time in days in this case. So last time we had time in years, this time it's time in days. And we'll also add our factor variable, which is medication. We want to know whether the time until recovery in this case um, is different between the medication um, groups. And we'll also do a compare factor for the log rank test. Make sure not to forget to put on the options, the survival plots, because we want to see them visually. And then, of course, we're going to paste this away and run this syntax to see what we'll get. So, of course, we'll get the survival table stratified for uh, medication and the standard medication. Now, we won't go over the survival tables, but we'll get straight down to the Kaplan-Meier curves, and that will give us the following results. Now, what is interesting is when we look at the survival function graph, so the Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, we will see there is a pretty striking difference between two specific periods of time in this, uh, in this graph. So on the x-axis, we see the time in days until the event, so until recovery. 
Uh, and what we can see is that before roughly 15 to 16 days into the follow-up time, we can see that there is no real difference or there appears not to be any difference in terms of how the medication is working. Both subpopulations or both groups are performing equally uh, or recovering equally slow, so to speak. The curves are more or less overlapping. Then after 16 days, roughly, uh, we can see that the curves are actually converging. So where the standard medication is still taking its time, or it's slowly recovering, the people from the normal, the new medication group, are actually recovering quite fast. And the same, we, we see the same thing happen, happening as well for uh, the later uh, group, but they only recover after some longer amount of days. So roughly 25 to 26 days is when the medication starts to work, or at least that's what we, what we can roughly grasp from these, uh, from, these, uh, from these curves here. Now, this is a typical scenario in which we do not actually meet the proportional hazards assumption. And the reason is, is that because in this period before 16 days, the hazards are roughly the same. Right? So we would expect the hazard ratio in that particular period to be somewhere around one because there is no difference between the groups or there appears not to be any difference. Whereas after 16 days, we can see a pretty huge difference actually. People in the medication groups are in a medication group are recovering much faster, much quicker than in the standard medication group. So there is a huge difference there. The pity here is, is that if we put these two, uh, if we would analyze this within the domain of a Cox regression, our assumption wouldn't hold because, like I said, over time, the difference in hazards do not appear to be constant, does not appear to be constant. It's different before and after 16 days. And therefore, what we will need to do is we actually need to analyze these two time periods, so before and after 16 days, uh, separately from one another. And that's what we can do with a Cox regression with a time-dependent covariate. So what we will do is we will add a separate covariate that represents time, or actually a dichotomized version of time, namely the period before and after 16 uh, days. And then what we will do is we will perform some kind of analysis with an interaction between this time-dependent covariate and the medication. So Roughly speaking, what we are doing is we are analyzing some form of effect modification based on time. And that's what we will be doing in this next part. So we'll be going to analyze survival, Cox regression with a time dependent covariate. And then we will be greeted with this screen. This may look a bit familiar. Um, it looks fairly similar to our, um, our compute variable uh, a screen in which we can make certain variables. And what we can do here is here we have to, um, uh, here we have to express uh, which value this time dependent covariate takes on as the value one. And we have to base that of course on time. So depending on which part of time, so before or after 16 days, we want to have represented as value one in this new variable is what we will input in this expression. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to use the time period after 16 days as um, the value one. So what I'll do is I'll double click on this. I'll say greater than 16. So that time period is going to be represented in this new variable as the value one. Now, after you input this expression, you can see that the model button has become available. So we'll press on that and then we'll be greeted with roughly the same screen as that we saw with normal Cox regression. And here we just proceed as normal. So what we'll do is we'll just put time in the time box, status in the status box with, of course, our event defined as one. We want to know, of course, what the effect of the medication is. So that's one of our covariates. And then in addition to that, we want to make an interaction term between that time dependent covariate as well as our medication covariate. We do that simply by holding the control button on our keyboard and then selecting both of these variables. Depending on whether you use a Mac or a Windows can be a bit different. For a, a Windows, it's the control button. Select them both. Then the A times B function will be available. You press that and SPSS will automatically generate an interaction term for you.
Now, normally when you're analyzing interaction, you also have to include the separate covariate into the equation, which in this case, you do not have to. So that is a tiny little difference, but it's important difference um, that you can do, that you'll have to do here in this Cox regression. Now, next up, we can go to options and I can ask for the confidence intervals. And besides that, we'll just proceed as normal. So we'll just press paste. And of course, we'll have to navigate and run that syntax. And we will get actually the exact same output as we saw earlier with Cox regression. We get our omnibus test for model coefficients. We get our uh, likelihood ratio, all that, um, all that stuff. But we'll be looking specifically at the variables in the equation because that is where we can now see what happens. So what we can see is that we have one line or one row for the effect of the medication in time period zero. So what that means is this effect right here shows us the effect of the medication before 16 days. And that is because we coded the time period after 16 days as one. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the interaction term now shows us the difference in effect of the medication uh, after 16 days as compared to before 16 days. And you can see that that effect changes by quite a margin. It's multiplied with a factor of 10.95, which is pretty huge. And you can also see that the effect at six, uh, before 16 days is actually fairly uh, moderate. It's not. It's not. It's not absent, but it's not very large either. It's only one point seven seven six. But that effect is modified after those sixteen days with a factor of roughly eleven. So if we would want to know what is the effect of the medication after sixteen days, what we could do is we could add up these terms, so the the logarithmic hazard, and then take the exponent of that. Alternatively, what you can do is you can actually change the coding of the time-dependent covariate. Uh, so instead of coding the period after 16 days as one, we code the period before 16 days as one. So in that case, the first row of the Cox regression will actually represent the effect of the medication after 16 days. So just to quickly illustrate that, we can go back to the survival and the Cox regression with the time-dependent covariate. So instead of using this expression, which states t is greater than 16, we'll say t is greater, uh, smaller or equal to 16. And we will just simply model as, as we did earlier. So I'll just press OK for now. And in that case, what we can see is that the effect of the medication is now shown to be after uh, 16 days, which is 19.461, which would roughly equate uh, the same amount uh, as if we did, um, which would roughly equate the same amount uh, that we would calculate if we added those two terms up from the last table. Uh, and similarly, we can work the other way around as well. So if from this table, we would want to know what the effect is before 16 days, we could simply add up the separate terms and exponentiate them to get back to the term that we saw earlier, that 1.776. So that was a little bit of a shorter video. Hopefully it was helpful for you and I will see you in the next.